So it's very fancy. <laughs> let's get started. Hi, everybody. Today we have Brendan Shapiro from UVA, who's going to tell us about uh, combinatorial homological algebra and K theory. Yeah, hi. Thanks for having me. It's really nice to be here. I don't think I've ever been to the University of Minnesota before. So. Yeah, so the the most of this talk is going to be a an extended analogy where we're going to start with things that won't be so surprising, but maybe putting them next to each other will be, and then get into some things which are, well, more surprising. So the basic analogy is between R modules, and finite sets. And to be fair, I'm actually just going to say sets for now. If we do finite sets, we want like finitely generated, possibly projective R modules. So, and if you're into these things, um, everything I say about R modules, Can apply to any abelian category, and anything I say about sets can apply to any extensive category. So this one's a bit less common, um, and I'll maybe say a bit more about what that means later on, but the idea is it includes anything that has a co-product or, or a disjoint union that really behaves like a disjoint union. So like finite G sets, um, spaces, categories, anything with a disjoint union that really like puts two things entirely separated from each other, uh, not like groups um, where they're very much not separate. So the basic analogy here is between extensions so we've got A includes into B, projects down to C, and A is the kernel of this map, C is the co-kernel of the quotient of this map, and an analogous idea for sets where we still have inclusions, but inclusions don't really have a, a nice notion of uh, co-kernel or quotient. Like we can we can collapse them. Uh, we can collapse everything in the image of this to a point. but, it doesn't behave as nicely. Um, we don't have, for instance, like if I started with a surjection like this, we don't have a good notion of a kernel. And the reason for that is that what when 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 we study these things in a way that was inspired by K theory, which I'm not going to talk about until later in the talk. What we find is that it ends up being more convenient to define extensions like this, where the, the second map is actually just a backwards inclusion. Um, and this being an extension, uh, you know, that's the kernel of this, and this is the co-kernel of that, corresponds to this being a complementary pair of inclusions. So that means that like C, uh, this, this inclusion corresponds to like the inclusion of the complement of A in B. 
And in this case, it's all symmetric and the unlike in our modules, all, all of these extensions are split in the sense that B is just going to be the disjoint union of A and C. And so the premise is that you can treat these things as the same. And when you do that, you get the sets end up and, and all of these other things that have disjoint unions like them end up behaving a lot like algebraic objects. And so we've, we've explored the consequences of that. And it was the left hand side is more like split extensions. Correspond, which correspond to those. Right. So yeah, so I mean those ones are all split extensions. Um, but if you if you start with extensions over here, if, if you start over there and you're like, these are split extensions, mm -hmm. great. And then you will say what should they be for modules, you would probably say split extensions. But if you start over here, so we want to treat sets as algebraic objects. Mm -hmm. So we're starting with all extensions here and taking all extensions over there. And it just so happens that sets have the property that they're all split. That's 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 sort of the perspective I would take on that. Because we want to have we, we want to have all the extensions um, for for various reasons that I think will become more clear. Right. So these properties, uh, these analogies extend a bit. So if we take we take Now two extensions, and we uh, so start with a square. So this is a square of our modules, it commutes, that's all we need to know. And then we can take the co-kernels and you'll get an induced surjection between the quotients. And in fact, that square will be a push out. And you can go both ways, just like if you start with a surjection, you can take its kernel. If you start with a push out square of these surjections and you take kernels, then you get an induced surjection here and a commuting square between them. So in this sense, kernel and co-kernel form this uh, sort of invertible correspondence between these two different types of objects. Injections and surjections, commutative squares like this, and put out squares like this. And it is symmetric in the sense that if we go the other way, we'll take, uh, I'm going to write. I'm going to use this notation for kernels. Uh, just to avoid cluttering the namespace with more letters. Um, you get something entirely analogous, except now this is a pullback, which is sort of in the corresponding position of the uh, of the diagram. And you have the property that if you do the same thing in the opposite direction here, you take kernels, or you do the same thing by taking co-kernels of this square, you get the same, you get the same thing in this corner. That's, uh, that's what we find, regardless of which way you take it. And that comes from the fact that 
uh, this composite map here has, has a factorization through its image as a surjection followed by an injection. On the set side, we can do exactly the same kind of thing if we're careful about what the squares are. So I'm going to write out a diagram of basically the same form. Except now the surjections are going to be backwards pointing injections. And instead of just commuting, we actually want this square to be a pullback. And we're going to see that that's necessary in order to get the same kind of thing happening. And in sets, I like to use these Venn diagram pictures to visualize all of this. So if the interior of this lobby circle is D. Then we've got B and C. And if it were a commuting square, A would just have to live inside this intersection. But because it's a pullback, we actually get that A is the entire intersection. The pullback of inclusions of finite sets is just in the intersection. So now we can go ahead and complete this picture. That I take the complement of C and D, take the complement A and B, we get a pullback again. And how do we see that? So um, so in this square, everything again includes into D. We've got B, same circle. And then as the thing we're going to intersect it with, we have D without C. So that's going to include this whole outer region as well as this sort of moon-shaped sliver of B that doesn't include A, because that's the part that's outside of C. And then we take the intersection of that with B. We're left with just this moon-shaped piece, and that's exactly B mod A. So we can do this again the other direction, replacing B and C. Also pull back and then over here. We also get a pullback and this piece actually has a name. And so on the opposite side of the diagram, this pullback square, uh, we take the intersection of everything except for C with everything except for B, and we get everything that doesn't contain either of them. Why am I doing this stuff? What's the what's the punchline here? Uh, can people see these boards? Is that can the owl see these boards? I uh, can yeah. see those boards. Okay. Yeah. Is that going to be like super inconvenient? Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Probably rather keep things up on the board. Oh, the awesome. owls. <laughs> it's always watching. Okay, so I said that we were going to try to treat finite sets as algebraic objects, and I've shown you one property where they kind of look alike, but what, what we're going for here is being able to actually do some more interesting things with them. So continuing this analogy, but over here, we have chain complexes. They look like 
one, two, I to the x, I minus one. So I'm not going to worry too much about what the grading is. Uh, the differentials go downward, and the the grading can be by integers. Um, and one way that we can rewrite this to be a little bit more like the tools we have access to is by since we're in the abelian category or in our module, we just take the images and give these a name. So these are the factorizations of the differentials through their image. Every, every map of our modules is a surjection followed by an injection. And so on sets, and I'm actually going to call these naive chain complexes. Um, because for the homological algebra part of the talk, they're exactly what we want and everything works great. For the K-theory part of the talk, they're not gonna quite be sufficient, um, but I'll get into that later on. And we just do almost the exact same thing. But we don't wanna just use functions between these kind of for the same reason we didn't want to use um, inclusions and surjections for these uh, extensions. Instead, we take these factorizations and replace the surjections with backwards inclusions. So, So our differentials look like spans of, uh, of inclusions. And we need a chain condition. So over here, you can express that as uh, this composite factoring through zero. And in fact, it's enough for this inclusion followed by this rejection to factor through zero. And we get the same thing over here, except we want it to be a pullback. And so what is this, what does this mean? Um, we've got, let's say three, three ones I've drawn. We have three circles, xi plus one, xi, xi minus one, and we have these spans of inclusions, which we can kind of think of as designated overlappings of subsequent circles. So this intersection drawn here is zi plus one, it includes into both xi plus one and xi. This one is zi, it includes into xi and xi minus one. Now we can take this a little bit further. So if I start with Does the zero mean the emphasis? Yes, thank you. In a few minutes when I write down the definition of like the, the structure that generalizes all of these, we usually use zero um, as the notation for that. So I often forgot to write uh empty set. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, is there? Oh, okay. Never mind. Can you do that as I said? That's my question. Cool. <laughs> all right. Sounds good. And uh, yeah, all other questions very welcome. So we can draw pictures like these to. describe the interesting things we like to do with chain complexes. For instance, take their homologies. So 
if we so we take the kernel of the differential, which only depends on this rejection to zi. And then because uh, because the square commutes, and by the universal property of the kernel, we know that zi plus one factors through that. But we can also observe that from what I wrote down over there, where this commuting square corresponds by taking kernels to a pullback square of to a pullback square like this. Um, and in fact, uh, we know that when this map that when this map factors through this one, its pullback always has this form of an isomorphism here, which I'm just going to write as the identity. And then the homology is the quotient of the kernel by the image. But what I like about this picture is that it actually shows um, you often see that you can construct homology in a different way by taking the quotient. If you take the quotient of Xi with respect to the image of the differential, you can do the exact same thing as this map factors through this one. So the, the co-kernel of this square is going to look like this. And the homology is the kernel of that map. And uh, you can work out that because this is zero and these two are smorphisms, that this map is by Cartesian, so the pullback and the push -up. So homology has this nice uh, grid of squares description over here. As you might expect, I'm going to do the exact same thing for sets. So we've got the i plus one. We take these inclusions. This is a pullback. So this is a pullback. The pullback of these two being the empty set is what ensures that these two subsets of Xi are disjoint. That's the, the, the analog of the chain condition here. And then we start taking complements. So we get Xi without Zi. That's the average one which of course includes ZI. We can do the same thing over here. And then completes a square to pullback, which will also be a put down. And that's going to give the homology. So what is this? We take the complement <laughs> of Zi in Xi, and then the comp. So that's that's this sort of left moon shaped bit of Xi, and we take the complement of Zi plus one in there, and we end up with. Hi is what's left in the middle. So we have this notion of homology and we can really see it. Something that always bothered me about homological algebra when I first started learning it was that like, I, I could sort of understand why these groups were, were meaningful. You know, you learn them in algebraic topology, you see a bit about what they correspond to, how they relate to homotopy groups and all that. But, I couldn't really wrap my head around like how to think about the homological algebra. Um, I really like visualizing things. And so when, when Mario and I started working on this and we 
found out what these things were actually were, then I started being able to make pictures for them. And I think that these can be helpful for understanding how homological algebra works and some of the intuition behind it. Especially because, as I'm about to start telling you, the things we like to do in homological algebra extend to this setting in pretty in pretty good generality. Um, but before I move on to that, I'll pause for questions. Yeah, I think I won't make anybody twist their head further than, than that board. So, So we want to see how far we can take this analogy. Like how much homological algebra can we do here? Um, and the more we get, the more we can apply to a much broader setting because it now includes chain comp naive chain complexes of sets like this, but those sets could also have a G action. They could be, um, they could be pre sheaves of some sort. They could be categories, they could be topological spaces. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily get, I don't know how meaningful doing this for topological spaces would be in, in terms of algebraic topology, but you, it applies to a lot of different examples. Anything where you can take these disjoint unions and, and complements of inclusions into them. So what do I have to tell you next? Uh, I'm going to give you two definitions. So, So just like in classical homological algebra, we, we consider exact complexes to be the ones that all have trivial homology. So in pictures, the way we want to draw this, um, I use the circles because they are good for intersections. But in this case, we can think of them as these tapes. And comparing it to the picture I drew over there, because there's no homology, there's nothing else inside of Xi other than these two images, Zi plus one and Zi. Xi is just these two pieces of the tape. And Xi minus one is the next two. Xi minus two is the next two, and so on and so forth. And this is going to be helpful for being able to recognize what some exact complexes are just long exact sequences in the context of this uh, combinatorial homology theory. So, other definitions. It, what do morphisms of chain complexes look like? Uh, so normally they would just be uh, maps between all of the components that commute with the differentials. Uh, in this case, that's a little bit complicated because the differentials are no longer maps. But so So 
So if we take two of these, X and Y, where I'm going to write their images respectively as Z and W. Then an M map, um, M stands for monomorphism. Um, there's also going to be another kind of map, an E map for epimorphism. It is a map like this where we make a few demands. We demand that these squares uh, with the part of the differential that points backwards are pullbacks. And we demand that these squares, the forward parts of the differential, are, they just have to commute. They don't have to be pullbacks. And this may feel a little bit random. Um, so now I'm going to justify it. And the way to justify this is just by building out the analogy with um, with R modules, but I think at this point it'll be easier to introduce some more notation for that. Um, and so this is where the fancier category theory comes in. But I think at this point we've seen where where these ideas are going. So to describe this thing, we use something called a double category. The gist of it is we have like two different kinds of morphisms and some notion of squares between them, rather than just a single type of morphism like you have in a category. And so we have a pair of categories. Uh, I'll write it M and E. M is for mono, E is for epi. Um, this being the, the motivating example. These two categories are going to have the same objects, um, again, just like uh, what we've drawn over there with the monos and the epis. And we're going to have some squares. And the squares, so the morphisms in here, in M, I'm going to draw with arrows that look like this, and the morphisms in E, I'm going to draw with arrows that look like that. And the squares are going to be the commuting these two types of arrows past each other. And I'm going to write the commuting sign for these. Um, that is sometimes more intuitive than other times, but in our case, uh, the existence of a square is just going to be a property of this uh, the, of these four arrows on the side. Um, in a general double category, there could be many different squares within with the same boundary, but that's not going to come up today. And so these squares are going to be composable. So if we have if we have two squares adjacent to each other like this, we could always compose these two arrows on the on the top and bottom. They come from they both come from M. And this is saying that we get that the, 
the composite for a boundary on the outside has a square on the inside. And you can do this horizontally, you can do this vertically, um, and it's going to be associative in both directions. Uh, it's going to have interchange, um, which is what if you have uh, a grid of four of these. Composing them is not going to depend on uh, rows, then columns, versus columns, then rows. And the examples of double categories that we're interested in are going to be first R modules with objects, R modules, the category M is going to be inclusions of R modules, E is the category of surjections of R modules in the other direction. So you have to pick which direction, since we're trying to generalize these, you have to pick which direction uh, you want the second type of arrow to go. Um, different people have different preferences for this, but I'm going to go with the sets convention. So the so these arrows are the forwards inclusions, and these arrows are the backwards surjections. And then uh, squares are just the ones that commute. And then For sets, we have the same idea. The objects are sets. M is forwards inclusions. E is also forwards inclusions. And what makes this interesting is that we are more selective about what the squares are. And so these properties that I mentioned at the beginning that let us do all of these homological algebra constructions are a double category. So you call these CGW categories. There are various uh, different letters you could put at the start of CGW, depending on the exact context you're trying to work in. Um, but the general idea is that a CG double category, a double category where you have an you know, initial object in both M and E, um, it's the same one. Shared initial object. Not only do they share an initial object, but they have the same isomorphisms in a sense that can be made more precise than I, I planned to. Um, and we see that in this example, just both uh, isomorphisms are both injections and surjections of our modules. And that's information that we want to record. And we have kernel, so kernel, equivalences between these two categories. And so that's the idea that if you have a map in one, you can flip it over 
using the kernel or the co-kernel, or in this case, the complement to get it of one or the other. And that applies to squares as well. It sends commuting squares to pullback squares in either category. Uh, that a commuting square to a pullback square in either category. And in some of the examples, we need to be more restrictive than pullbacks, but that will come up today. And in what I wrote before, where these um, morphisms in E are surjections going the other way, a pullback in that category is a push out of surjections. So we have this symmetry in the definition. So before I move on, are there any questions on that? Yeah. I have a question. I just not super clear on what we mean by co kernel, co kernel equivalences. Like, is that like, of the maps that are shared between E and M, the kernel in E is the co-kernel in M, or? Well, let me make that more precise. Um, I was I was a little bit intentionally vague about that. Uh, I'm sorry for but that. No, that's okay. Being intentionally vague is fine if people more or less get what you mean. And if someone has a question, that means that's not the case. So I appreciate that. So the way we do it is we say that we have a category whose objects are M morphisms and whose morphisms are squares between M morphisms. And then we also have a category whose objects are E morphisms and whose morphisms are, let's say, pullback squares between E morphisms. And so we want these two categories to be equivalent to each other. And what that equivalence does, um, it actually preserves uh, the, the, the co-domain objects on both sides, um, because ultimately we want, we want it to look like this. And so the equivalence, if we take the complement or the co-kernel, uh, just sends this object to this object, this object to this object, this square as a morphism here to this square as a morphism there. And we want those two to be equivalent. And here I only wrote it down for E morphisms, but if you reflected this and switch that with, a, with M morphisms, you would get the same thing. Everything here is symmetric between the two. So thank you for asking. I hope that answered the question. Very much so. Yeah. So the main reason I introduced all of this terminology at this particular moment is so that I could clean up this picture a bit. So the chain complexes our chain complexes in general are going to look like a backwards E morphism followed by an M morphism as the differentials.
And the reason why I call these M chain maps is because they are chain M maps. And when you look at this picture, it makes more sense because in general, when we don't assume before these were all inclusions and it might have seemed arbitrary which ones I was making pullbacks, but now we don't have a lot of options. We've restrained ourselves since the M and the E morphisms don't live in the same category. The only thing we can put in this square is a square in the double category. And in these squares, we do have choices. We, we, we could ask them to be pullbacks. And in some sense, that might be expected. But a good heuristic for why we don't want to do that is if we if we replace the, if we do this in the example of R modules, we want this to agree with what we started with. And their chain maps, you know, the whole differential has to commute with the maps. And there, this square is commuting, and we want this square to be commuting as well. So is it that the, the total commutativity condition of the differential with these maps is just commutativity? So that helps us realize what it should look like in the case of sets. But in my mind, since I mentioned that I, I just like thinking of everything as pictures, I want to know what this looks like in terms of these Venn diagram pictures. So, orient this right. So if we have make this bigger. So these are inclusions of sets. So we're going to want the outermost picture to be the codomain chain complex. Why? So y i plus one, y i y. It's two, and then these intersections, w i plus one, w i w i minus one. And we know, and so first of all, if we just look at the inclusions on the degrees, the xi's into the yi's, we know the sum of y i plus one is going to be coming from xi plus one, and some of it won't be. So we got to draw a line through it. And we know that some of yi will come from xi. And so on for each of these. Now I've drawn these lines in a very particular way that corresponds to the different natures of these squares, where these ones over here are pullbacks and the other ones aren't. So in particular, I'll add in the Z's. So if we look in this pullback square, we see that ZI should be the intersection of XI and WI in YI. So xi is this sort of upper diagonal half of the yi circle. zi, or rather wi, is this sliver here intersecting between these two circles. And if we take the intersection of them, it is this little triangle zi. And 
So sort of by shifting, we see that all the other ones should look like that as well. That doesn't fully explain this shape yet. What about this other circle where z i plus one agrees in y i with its image in x i and w i plus one? So z i plus one lives in x i, it lives in w i plus one, it lives in y i, but it's not the intersection. There's some of x i intersect w i plus one that is not necessarily in z i plus one. And so now we get to the sales pitch at least uh, what I think is a big part of it, for why this is a, why the idea of doing homological algebra in this combinatorial setting makes sense and is like robust enough to be worth talking about. And it's because if we have an M-chain map, you know, in this picture, it was real simple talking about the homologies. You, know, you can see them pretty clearly. Hi plus one, Hi, Hi minus one. They're just sort of part of this sequence of subsets. This picture is a lot messier. The theorem is that uh, let's say oh. Uh, I think I first heard this from Doug Raffanel. When you have to add a bunch of conditions to a theorem in order to feel safe that what you're saying is actually true, you say, my lawyer made me say this. <laughs> you know, there are some conditions. I haven't told you all the axioms. They affect what the name of these things are. Um, so that's the nice G CGW category. But the point is, in any setting that has these properties and enough uh, mostly reasonable looking axioms. These are gonna, I hope I'm not the lawyer in this tale. Okay. I mean, no more than I am. We both made up these, these words and conditions. A lawyer is uh, not wanting to lie to you all. <laughs> even if I'm telling moral truths. Long exact sequence of a pair. Um, and a related fact to this is that, uh, and in fact, the how is proven. The snake one. I said we could treat these as algebraic objects. That extends as far as being able to prove an analog of the snake lemma. And from that, we get a long exact sequence of a pair. And while I'm not, uh, I'm certainly not going to write out a formal proof of this, uh, the reason I gave you this uh, image to keep in mind for the exact complexes, which are the, the what I mean here by long exact sequence. So what is our long exact sequence? We have HI 
of X, H I of Y, H I of something, um, I'm gonna call it Y without X, H I minus one of X and so on. A long exact sequence is a sequence of these spans in the sets case, actual spans of inclusions. In the modules case, these are just uh, image factorizations of functions. Being exact means that, um, well, Being a comp being a chain complex gives us that these commute, but in fact, being exact is going to correspond to them being bicartesian. Um, we call them distinguished squares and CGW categories, but in both of our examples here, they're just bicartesian. But the point is that there is some sequence, namely the objects that live uh, at the apexes of these spans, such that, such that if we list them out on a tape like this and take subsequent pairs of them, then we're gonna get these homologies. So let me just draw out that tape. Um, we start with this one here, and this one here. Um, and it does look a little snake-like. And just to quickly describe why this is true, if you look at these two, they are the homology, the, the i homology of, of y. It is y without wi plus one and wi. If you look at these two, that's the i homology of x, where we've taken this whole half circle, cut out this part, cut out this part, this is what's left. Um, and if you take uh, y without x to be sort of the other half circles in y, you see that their homology is given by these as well. And so I'll, I'll conclude with just one more um, very quick, since I promised some K theory, I won't mention much about K theory only to say that these chain complexes of sets are almost good enough for K theory. And the almost is because we actually need to use general functions in the forward maps. So if we replace these with non-naive chain complexes, these have a K theory space, A of chain complexes of finite sets, finite This is homotopy equivalent to the classical K theory. 
of finite sets, which is known to be uh, equivalent to the sphere spectrum. And so this gives a, a model for that that looks like chain complexes. I'll stop there. Thanks. Any questions? Do you prove this by some sort of Gillet Waldhausen theorem? Yeah, so, well, sort of. Okay. I would say this is some sort of Gillet Waldhausen theorem. Um, so what? the paper that Wait, sorry, what is? Are you, are you referring to their pretty quillen or? Oh, sorry, no. Um, so the gillet waldhausen theorem is the statement that the K theory of chain complexes of finite sets is equivalent to the K theory of finite sets. Um, so this is So the title of our paper on this is called a gillet waldhausen theorem for chain complexes of sets. And the gillet waldhausen theorem for chain complexes of sets is the statement that the K-theory of these chain complexes is equivalent to ordinary finite sets. Um, and the proof of this is similar to one of the proofs of gillet waldhausen um, And the, the tricky parts come in setting up this axiomatic framework to include finite sets, working out what we need out of these chain complexes beyond just the naive ones in order to get the K-theory to work. Um, for instance, things like the additivity theorem uh, require this for various reasons. And then having all of the theorems proven in this level of generality that go into the proof of gillet waldhausen And then the argument is based proof. Cool. Thank you. So in the module case, like one of the reasons to switch from like calculating K theory from modules to calculating K theory from chain complexes is like you've got a better ambient category that has like telescopes and some more other category that serves as like group completion. Is there something like similar, like these objects of chain complexes of sets give you some like a all having category that matches properties or so that's a really good question. Um so uh, I'll answer two questions from there. Um, do they form a Waldhausen category? Not, we don't think so. Um, it's hard to say no, certainly not. Um, and there are some ways to simplify it to get it to look more like that. Um, for instance, these, uh, these differentials are up to a choice of the object here, partial functions, um, where this is the domain inclusion. Uh, and this is the, the function from the domain. Um, and so you can you can work out what like the co-vibrations should be in a Waldhausen category. It doesn't appear that and, and the weak equivalences, it doesn't appear that they are going to satisfy the axioms, um, whereas they do satisfy ours. Uh, it's interesting with Waldhausen categories because ultimately we, you know, set up a framework where we have these CGW categories with a notion of weak equivalences, but it's more algebraic than Waldhausen categories. So they don't always, well, Waldhausen categories don't always fit our model, but our model doesn't also doesn't always correspond to a Waldhausen category, um, and so we think we're. We think we've diverged from that a little bit, but it's hard to say for sure that they don't. Um, as to the other part of your question, what kind of like homotopical tools do we have here? You mentioned the telescopes, yeah. I think, like you want cylinders, cones. We have a lot of them, but they're not as nice. At, at least at the moment, I'm not aware of any that are like, as nice. I think like cylinders aren't functorial in some ways that you might want. So that's certainly a motivation to get more tools available for studying the K theory of finite sets, but it's they don't all seem to work quite as well as they do in the algebraic setting. But that's something we're very interested in. Yeah. 
Can I abuse the fact that I also know about this to expand a little bit on that? Um, so we we worked so hard to get a good cylinder. Like we, we really wanted to get a good cylinder and we didn't quite manage to, but we didn't fail so catastrophically either to completely abandon the idea. <laughs> so what we think might be feasible is if you move to a slightly richer context, like if you move from just finite sets to say like varieties with complements of open and closed inclusions, maybe there you're just rich enough that we can get the cylinder that we were after while still having this more like complementary description. So that's something that we have like in mind. Okay. I would, yeah. I, I would say. Seeing a setting like, if we could find a setting like that where you can do all of this, but where the morphisms go but the other way, that that would really be exciting. I would expand a lot of the bulk of K theory into this setting, which would be really great. Could I ask a bit about that? I, I much of um, like what has just been said, I I don't understand. It's not part of things I know about. But when you say cylinder, it may be you know, like for, for me there, there's a mapping cone, and if we got complexes, one direction we can go is instead of then a, a category with complexes, and you may build up to the derived category and and such like in those intermediate stages like homotopy category and so forth. It is is this a development which is part of what you're doing? It's very closely related. Um, and, and it's very similar to, to the previous question as well, in the sense that like we we're building these things as K theory. And so we're so like you start with some kind of objects and morphisms and weak equivalences between them. Um, just like in chain complexes, we have quasi isomorphisms. And then you move up and, and then you you turn them into something, this K theory space. And more or less, what we're often trying to do is take two different K theory spaces based on two different types of things and show that they're equivalent or some others to kind of similar statement about them. And the way you do that is often using things like you know, mapping cylinders, mapping cones. Uh, constructions which let you take one object and mess around with it a little bit and turn it into something that behaves more nicely with another object. And so I we haven't thought so much about like, you know, like the derived category based on these chain complexes. It's come up in conversation. Um, and I think it would probably be interesting. Um, in fact, something that we've wanted is like, uh, chain complexes of R modules have a dual con theorem, which says that they correspond to simplicial R modules. Um, I'm not aware of anything like that here. We've, we've tried a little bit to think of it, but it's kind of hard to work out what the other kind of object should be. Um, so I think that's a really interesting question. So far, we've mostly only used those pieces as techniques for other things. But I think it's probably like, I think like the homotopy theory of chain complexes of sets or of whatever else is, is a meaningful construct. We just haven't like got the tools to, to do too much with it yet. I, I would have thought that the, the, the homotopy notion might turn out to be um, trivial and the sort of setup where you've got, because you, you've got these, you're, you're considering these morphisms where you where, where, where there's a symmetry about them like so you, mm -hmm. you've got an inclusion and then the other thing includes something else into something else and so you you can turn the you, you've got a duality on the self-equivalent controversial self-equivalence on the category which turns things around I, I suppose and this makes structure well, sort of easier to handle I would think by doing that but I would have my my, my sort of gut feeling is that it might make things trivial because the complexes are behaving like split 
sequence mm -hmm. that's more, you know. Um, yeah, it's it's. I I actually uh, sort of was surprised at one point. Um, I, I I came. To, I think I came to a similar conclusion in my head, and I had to kind of backtrack a little bit. And I think part of it is that, like, when we're doing K theory, um, like the the automorphisms of the objects end up like playing just as big a role as the extensions. So, like for sets, the extensions aren't very interesting because um, they're all split, but the automorphisms are. Like they have these symmetric groups, and we and, and, and those are very interesting. Um, so I think that like yeah, because there's kind of these two different parts to it, right? There's sort of the 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 duality nature, like you said. But we have that in our modules as well. Like that shows up in algebraic settings. Nothing is completely symmetric, of course. Like they are different, um, especially in the settings we do K-theory in. But like the uh, for sets where they're symmetric, I think then it kind of just reduces it to the question about what are the extensions? They're just you know basically addition. Um, and then what are the automorphisms? And that's where all the the interesting stuff lies. Um, but on the other hand, if we could show that similar information were enough to declare something as trivial as finite sets, we'd be in great shape because finite sets give us something that we uh, quite like. So. <laughs> so I hope you're right. Any other questions? Then let's thank Brenda again.